Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are in the world. And welcome back to my podcast, The Caring Economy, with me, Toby Usnick. And today I have my friend and colleague and a client, actually, Vanessa Barboni Halik, who is the founder and CEO of Another Tomorrow. Another Tomorrow is a sustainable luxury fashion brand. If you don't know it, you're going to know it and you're going to want to buy it, either for yourself or for those you care about. Um, Vanessa, welcome to The Caring Economy. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Vanessa and I got to know each other through a mutual friend a few years ago, and we've sort of clicked because we're in a similar space of caring and purpose-driven businesses. Um, Vanessa, to that end, I'd love you to share with our listeners a little bit about your story, your personal story, um, how you got where you are today, in a sense, from your childhood, fast forward to today. I'd be happy to share in so many ways sitting here today is my entire life coming full circle. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the Midwest in small college towns, uh, first in the cornfields of Iowa in Grinnell, Iowa. My mom was an artist. My dad was a sociology professor initially. And I really grew up in this incredible circle of academics and ideas. Um, and it was really kind of just in, in the water, so to speak, in my household, that there was this opportunity to change the world and live a purposeful life, um, really solving problems through the intersections of disciplines. And I often reflect on one of my earliest memories, which was me sitting cross-legged on the floor of my parents' little study with the whole earth catalog in my lap and these visions of these you know, geodesic domes that you could build in your, in your backyard. Um, and then shortly thereafter, what was so interesting is that my, my dad was really involved in um, the earliest stages of the internet. And so I had, um, you know, the, the internet at home in the days of, of Next Computer. And uh, okay. Next Computer, for those of you guys who don't know, was sort of Steve Jobs' project when he got kicked out of Apple before he went back to there. Mm -hmm. And so um, really had access to technology as a tool at a very young age and, and sort of the inner workings of that, which I think is really stable um, as being an enabler. And then, um, you know, some crazy things happened in my adolescence. Uh, my mom, uh, unfortunately, in life when I was 18, and I did a really hard pivot without even really being totally aware of it. Mm -hmm. I switched majors having been um, initially focused on architecture then um, decided to go into economics. I ended up in the world of finance. And you know, finance was an interesting place for me to be because I think in so many respects, it, it, um, it addressed this real hunger I had to get out and explore the world. Um, and so it was phenomenal from that standpoint. Um, I focused on emerging markets and really came to see this planet as being one you know, interconnected whole and in a sort of firsthand way. Um, and it also just frankly, you know, solved a lot of that desire to take care of myself and you know, be independent and, and feel safe. And so I stayed at Morgan Stanley for 15 years. And during that time, um, I had the remarkable opportunity to be an entrepreneur and to actually build businesses within that umbrella. So um, living through the, the financial crisis was a fascinating thing. And for so many of the investment banks, it marked a real turning point for um, the, the way that they operated. And in particular on the trading side, um, which is where I was, which was you know, fairly unusual for, <laughs> for a woman. Woman, yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, to say the least. It's changed there's, a bit, but still there's room to improve. There's, there's room to improve. There's room to improve. And, uh, and the only reason I did is that, frankly, my first boss talked me into it. He was just <laughs> absolutely adamant that it was the best personality fit for me. And uh, I don't know, I could probably reinforce a few character traits, if I'm honest. But uh, um, in, in any case, it worked out. You know, it, it worked out. It worked out. And, and in particular, you know, coming out of the crisis, um, there was this real need to build a financially sustainable um, business models with high quality revenue streams mm -hmm. in a very client facing way. And I got to really rebuild um, a bunch of the emerging markets businesses, institutional businesses that had kind of been decimated in the crisis. And that was my first real taste at, uh, at building teams, at building businesses, and at doing so 
really with a deep focus on, on what the client's evolving needs were. So that was, that was great. Mm -hmm. um, but the one thing that I really struggled with uh, throughout those 15, years and, and I actually left a couple of times but the third time the third time stuck <laughs> was you know I was working so hard and I wasn't living my full self uh, being honest yes. uh, the harder I worked the more certain parts of my kind of being and personality it started to fall away and I really questioned to a degree whether um, the the impact of my energy was was what it should be from a from a purpose perspective, and I got to the end of 2016, and it was fairly obvious in that juncture that the world was not going in the direction that I thought it might. Which I think in me had engendered a little bit of laziness, if I'm honest. Of you know mm -hmm. how much of a part did I need to play? Um, and it really kicked into gear, uh, this idea that I needed to shift gears in terms of how I was spending my energy. And the only way that I could really um, see that clearly was to zoom way out. Okay. Not what's my next move, but 20 years from now, what will I have wanted the past 20 years to have been about? Mm -hmm. Your legacy. And my legacy and uh and for me that was that was about purpose and about where i could uniquely add value um and it was really going back to that that idealism and and that idea that we can create change that i grew up with and and also that sense of of tangible creation also that i had grown up with and so you know i initially thought i would stay in the industry and just shift gears from emerging markets to sustainable finance. Uh, I really saw a huge opportunity at the time, and I still do, um, to change the parameters by which we allocate capital, you know, and therefore address, address incentives. And so that's what I set out to do. And I have to say the firm was phenomenal um, about the flexibility. And I ended up taking a sabbatical. And in that sabbatical, um, that was when the beautiful sort of accident of another tomorrow happened because I thought I really needed to have a deep understanding of how the major industries were actually throwing off all of these negative externalities, these massively negative unanticipated consequences. And um, so I spent a lot of time doing that and I found it, you know, frankly, fairly straightforward how most industries screw things up, you know, oil and gas, pretty obvious, logistics, fairly straightforward, food, even reasonably understandable. Um, but wow, fashion just blew me away. And uh, I certainly had a close personal relationship with fashion. It was my one real area of personal expression when I was in finance. Mm -hmm. And the magnitude of the impact and the complexity of the impact was just mind-boggling and and i was so shocked by my own lack of knowledge it just hadn't been on my radar screen and you know as somebody who's driving you know an electric car and has solar panels you know uh, I, I was a little bit smug about sort of my own understanding of sustainability and it really kind of rocked my world um and i came to see that the industry was you know a solid decade behind others and really owning the problem and, and really getting after it and the cons in consumer understanding and um, long story short, uh, it became clear to me that challenger brands can make a real difference, particularly in shifting norms. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that was how Another Tomorrow was, was really born, you know, as that challenger brand that was sensitive to the customer's core needs, but also really sensitive to the direction that the, that the industry mm -hmm. needs to go. It's interesting, in all my years, I've never heard that expression challenge your brand, and yet instinctively I know what it is when you say it, and that is what Another Tomorrow is. So yeah. was there an aha moment that, uh, Vanessa, you had where you said, I need to build something or respond to this, or did you see? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. You know, it was, uh, I, I definitely didn't, you know, glean the information and then decide, oh my gosh, I have to radically change my career. Initially, the step was, well, I should really take this on board first as a consumer and just change my habits. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, even as somebody on a cycle, like doing three hours of research to find a t-shirt, only to find that you really didn't want it in, you know, in the end, it was incredibly frustrating just speaking to the, you know, the opacity uh, of mm -hmm. the industry. Um, I think what really finally was the straw that kind of broke the camel's back was 
at, at one stage I got so frustrated that I decided I would only buy things secondhand. I would only buy resale. Mm -hmm. And I bought a pair of shoes off of a third party resale platform and I won't say which one. And they came three weeks late from Australia and they didn't fit. <laughs> I just said, you know, to heck with this. This is not the solution either. Yeah, and right. The only way I could describe it is I was just, it was information I couldn't unknow. I could not tell myself that I can just retain all of this information that I learned and go back to the way or, or some portion of the way that I used to, mm -hmm. to consume. And, uh, and I was just stubborn about it. And I just started talking to other people about whether or not this was a problem that they were trying to solve. And, uh, you know, the initial uh, answers I got, you could have interpreted as not being very encouraging because sure. people were generally where I had been. They were totally unaware of the impact uh, of, their, of their purchases. But what was really interesting to me was that they were living their other parts of their lives with a lot of intention. So where that level of awareness was, their, you know, the behavior followed. Mm -hmm. um, and there was an understanding of sustainability, um, at least through this lens of fewer better things. Mm -hmm. And the way that people thought about it was that they wanted to buy you know, clothing that was kind of this heirloom quality, this, you know, luxury in the truest, you know, oldest sense of the word in terms of, you know, timelessness and, and, and mm -hmm. being able to pass down from generation to generation. But they were really tired of sort of the games that they saw in the market. They were tired of the sales cycles. They felt silly, you know, paying through the nose to buy, you know, to buy this level of quality. And so that was where the, the consumer problem was. It was how can I get access to that level of quality um, at, a, at a price point that felt mm -hmm. like it made more sense or it was more accessible. And I thought, okay, that's the way in because yep. it's such a congested market. Um, you know, coming from a finance background, kind of the last thing you want to do is start a fashion brand, right? <laughs> it seems like the best way to kind of burn a pile of cash. But um, so I really knew that it was, um, it was only going to work if it truly solved for a white space in the conventional market. Uh -huh. and, and that's where I saw ourselves basically able to put down a stake, really solve something that the consumer was trying to solve, but do so in a holistically sustainable way. Mm -hmm. and utilizing both technology and business models that could truly help to lead the industry as well. Great. I, I want to come back to that technology piece in particular, but uh, ladies and gentlemen, just as a reminder, we have today Vanessa Barboni Halik, who's the founder and CEO of Another Tomorrow, a global sustainable luxury brand that's, in my view, quite different than all the other ones out there that are trying to be differentiated. Um, and I think tech is one of those ways in which you're doing that at Another Tomorrow, Vanessa. Um, I didn't know until you mentioned it a moment ago that you, your father exposed you to early days of the internet when you were a little kid growing up in the Midwest college town, um, where my cousin Susan actually went to college as well, Grinnell. Um, but how, how does the tech play come into this? You, you know that it can be efficient and effective, but um, it sounds like it's even bigger than that. Can you tell us a little bit about the tech role in Another Tomorrow? Yeah, absolutely. So for, for me, this is um, addressing two of the systemic problems in the industry. So one is uh, the opacity problem. So mm -hmm. uh, we utilize technology to uh, demonstrate to the consumer the entirety of the supply chain. So that doesn't mean that everybody's interested, but it means that the, in the information is readily available for those uh, who are. And so basically what we've done is we've created unique digital identities for every single item that we produce. Mm -hmm. There is uh, essentially a cloud-based uh, database of information that sits uh, behind each of those digital identities. And you can currently scan a QR code, and someday that might be NFC, probably not too long from now, mm -hmm. um, to see uh, the entirety of the supply chain behind it. So that's bringing transparency to an opaque industry um, and is creating trust which I think mm -hmm. is, is, is really lacking. So that's one piece of it. Now, the, the other part that I think is really critical is we utilize that same technology to authenticate product for resale. So counterfeits are arguably the, one of the biggest problems, if not the biggest problem in the resale market of, of mm -hmm. all kinds. And so we have the ability to take back product. And because we have the, these unique digital identities, 
we know that it's ours and we can resell it. Um, we can resell it with trust um, and, and really bridge that gap to that next consumer. So we're really excited about that. And then, you know, the, there are other use cases for technology that I think um, bring both operational efficiency in terms of logistics management. That's all great. Um, and then ultimately also, um, you know, adding services onto products. So mm -hmm. imagine a moment where, you know, you pull your blazer out on a Tuesday morning and you're thinking, gosh, what the heck do I wear this with? Um, and you're able to scan this and access, you know, styling services, things of that nature. So that, that's coming down the road for us, but, but really we're mostly focused on utilizing technology to really unlock transparency and unlock authentication. So let me ask you uh, if I understand correctly. So as an example, I know that you do some sourcing of material in New Zealand, right? Um, uh, does it get to that level where your your vendors there are participating in the technology? Yeah, so so we source our wool um, from two ethical farms in Tasmania and um, Sorry, Tasmania, not New Zealand. Yeah, very, very close. New Zealand is another is another great destination for ethical, uh, ethical wool. Um, they have really strict, stringent standards. So the way that we have done it, given the fragmentation of the industry and specifically the fact that we're working uh, within luxury and in the intermediate part of the supply chain is that we take responsibility for putting all of the data in at every single stage. Um, there are ways that you can um, activate your uh, partners to input the data themselves. You can utilize blockchain as well. Mm -hmm. um, in this initial iteration, um, we found that there was not a consistent level of technological sophistication across mm -hmm. our supplier base. And so at the moment, we are the ones responsible for putting in that data. But there is definitely a world in which um, that changes. And I see that happening soon. Great. Um, so let's go back to this concept of a challenger brand as well. Um, and that's a way that's differentiating you. Um, first of all, for our listeners here on The Caring Economy, could you give some examples of perhaps a competitor or two of yours in your mind or in their minds? Oh, gosh. You know, we, we think about um, the other brands with similar values as being um, phenomenal collaborative partners, because I think that those that, that, that really care about these issues tend to take a fairly open source approach mm -hmm. to their learnings, which I think is really exciting. And um, a couple of the ones that I would highlight, I mean, first and foremost, I would say certainly Patagonia, mm -hmm. uh, you know, different category, but very similar from a values uh, perspective. Um, Eileen Fisher, um, you know, slight, a little bit more adjacent, uh, slightly different market positioning. Uh, also, you know, phenomenal in terms of their sort of open source information approach. Um, and then on the smaller side, uh, I would highlight Mara Hoffman, who didn't start out that way, but made a radical shift in, you know, their supply chain once they were kind of educated on the, mm -hmm. on the impacts, which I really respect a lot. And again, they're, they're super open. So, those are some of the, the, the ones that I would highlight. I think that um, where I saw the, the challenger brand piece uh, come up the most was really in the food industry. So if you think about both in food, food and actually in beauty as well, you had this situation where these smaller companies started to source very differently mm. and produce still very high quality and oftentimes higher quality products in that way. And they just started taking little bites out of market share. You know, it wasn't like there was this one big challenger brand that just came and swooped everything. Yeah. Um, but they really started to shift norms and really started to, um, to, to, to matter. Yeah. Well, I, I've heard you say before that um, when you talk about impact, you, you're thinking um, above and beyond supply chains as well. And I wonder, um, building on that challenger brand concept, if that's part of it, if you're, um, if you're, well, I don't want to, I don't want to lead you, but tell us a little bit about things like uh, fair wages and other ways yeah. in which you're, you're trying to live and breathe the values of another tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, one of the things that I felt was really missing um, were brands that, that didn't just sort of pick an issue and talk about that, but really thought about um, their values from a holistic standpoint. And so for us, that encompasses 
environmental welfare, human welfare, which you reference, and animal welfare. Because um, I think that if you uh, act with both data and science and, 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 and also compassion, you kind of have to consider all of those things. And so, um, you know, I'm glad that you mentioned the, the wages piece, because if you look at um, where a huge part of the impact of the industry is, I mean, the statistics vary, but, you know, by and large, um, you know, 90% of garment workers don't earn a living wage. Um, and that is, that is just a travesty. And it's one of those things that has, continuously come up on the front pages only to disappear again, literally for over a century. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something that we really, really try and, and shine a light on. And I think when people are looking at different brands and trying to ascertain uh, how serious are they about even their environmental commitments, actually what they do on wages and how they treat people is is one of the clearest indications of the level of sort of you know bs <laughs> on the environmental yeah. plane right um, because if you look at um the sort of cost attribution to a garment switching from conventional to organic cotton which is a very important change actually doesn't add very much to the price uh, but ensuring that your um the people who are making those garments are paid a living wage i mean that, that that's a real that's mm -hmm. a real shift potentially so mm -hmm. it takes it takes some seriousness um, so, so we do make sure that everyone who manufactures anything for us earns a living wage. Um, from an animal welfare perspective, um, we basically take the approach that no animal uh, should be harmed or killed uh, to make our product. And uh, the one animal product that we use is um, merino wool. And that's where I felt it was extremely important to have those farm level relationships. I definitely didn't didn't start a sustainable fashion brand to take part in <laughs> industrialized agricultural practices I didn't agree with. So that was really critical uh, for us. And then the environmental piece is, is complex. And I think that the really interesting part about the environmental piece is that sometimes um, there isn't a right answer. Sometimes the, the science conflicts and that's where your values have to mm -hmm. come, into, come into play. And so uh, for, us, for us, that manifests in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, the, uh, the big chunk of impact uh, from apparel comes at the raw material sourcing level. Mm -hmm. And so for us, uh, that means using only organic natural materials. So organic cotton, organic linen that can be traced back to its source. Um, because it's quite local, the impacts. Um, we utilize uh, cellulosic fibers that come from sustainably managed forests with adequate biodiversity uh, mm -hmm. protections. And we don't use any virgin cashmere, largely because of the supply demand issues um, in cashmere that have led to desertification in Mongolia. And then it also, you know, there are layers on top of that around uh, textile processing, dyes, waste water management, you name it. But oh. it's, it's fairly, fairly nuanced uh, and, and complex. Uh, I should ask you for our listeners, uh, again, ladies and gentlemen, we have Vanessa Barboni, who's the founder and CEO of Another Tomorrow, the global luxury fashion, sustainable fashion brand. Where does my listener find um, Another Tomorrow that mom is it uh online is it shops where do you refer people so you can find us online at www.anothertomorrow.co uh, we are a predominantly direct to consumer company that is what allows us to offer the exceptional quality that we do for the price point that we do uh, we also have uh, an exclusive wholesale partnership with matches fashion so you can find us on matches fashion as well and we have some wonderful um, brick and mortar boutique partners, uh, both in Dallas at the conservatory um, and in Aspen uh, at Max. So you can find us in all of those ways. Fantastic, and Christmas is coming and, and, is coming. Uh, and other holidays. Um, Vanessa, can you tell us a little bit about, I mean, I love the, the, um, the B2C concept because it certainly anticipates, even though it wasn't deliberate, it anticipates COVID-19 and how people are shopping now, right? I mean nobody's going into stores they weren't i would submit that in many major markets they weren't before covid now covid's here you see the rise in amazon jd in china other places what how um how has your business weathered covid and um any silver linings there yeah you know i think what uh it's, it's obviously been a challenging period for everyone but i have to say i think that um, crisis is clarifying and the quality of decision making really goes up and so, you know, a couple of a couple of silver linings. One was, 
I think it really brought our partnerships to the forefront. And I was um, so appreciative of you know, everything that we saw uh, from, from our partners. It's really been a mutual support system, which has just been phenomenal. And in certain ways has really surprised me. You know, I was worried about one of our farms, for example, and I was thinking, oh my gosh, you know, how can you help you? How can we help you? And they said, forget about us. We're, we're fine. You know, we're hanging out down here. How can we help you? You know, would it, awesome. would it be useful to, you know, kind of wait a couple months to purchase this wool? So, you know, really it's been a mutual support system. Um, some of the, you know, sort of business kind of brax tax things that have been really helpful are one, it, it really pushed us to build these um, boutique relationships. So I really think about them more as hubs of community than anything else. So how can you integrate into your core business these boutique structures as sort of a hub and spoke model to get you know, product in front of in front of customers and build relationships in a scalable way. So that's been really exciting. I don't know if we would have done that um, otherwise. Um, and we've started to build out, um, you know, a commission based uh, sales strategy that does something very similar, because I think at the end of the day, um, luxury is still very relational. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that I, you know, I certainly have experienced and value. And it's something that I think that we'll need to come back you know, post, post COVID or even during COVID, because as much as online sales are great, mm -hmm. um, it feels pretty cold at some point. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that we're going to need to find these ways to humanize our, our businesses. Yes, I agree. You know, the concept of luxury is, I love to ask people what their definition of luxury is. Um, I, I, I was told, I don't know if it's an apocryphal story or not, but I was told once that I think it was the CEO of Hermes or an executive at Hermes when asked that question said that a, a luxury item is something that's worth repairing. And uh, I like that. Um, Me too. I actually, you cited Patagonia earlier. Yvonne Chouinard is a hero for me because he, he embodies that. Even though Patagonia jackets are not necessarily a luxury in the same classification as say another tomorrow, people cherish their Patagonia items and they will put duct tape on a puffy coat as a badge yeah. of honor. And I grew up that way. We had hand-me-downs with a large family in the Midwest. And I think that those values are timeless in me. And I think that we will, I hope that we are. And I believe brands like yours, Vanessa, are hearkening back to that sense of what endures, what is quality, what, what are the true costs of our consumption? Yeah. So, if you if you have a definition of luxury, I'd love to hear it. I don't want to put you on the spot. No, it's it's fascinating. I think that really that really resonates um, with me. I, I think it's it's funny. One of the earliest interviews I did was actually specifically on that topic, and it, it does differ from one person to the next. And I think it's really a mirror of your personal values mm -hmm. and. Uh, not to go too off piece, but, but one of my favorite books is actually this, um, this book by the economist Marina Mazzucato, which was about, uh, it's called The Value of Everything. And it's for so long, luxury was, has been defined by price. So, you know, a t-shirt that cost $500, but was made in a way that was perhaps inferior to something that cost $30 was deemed luxury. And so for me, um, luxury is, is really all about um, the inherent values and impact of how something is made. And yeah. ultimately that does manifest in something worth repairing because mm -hmm. there's a relationship with it and there's a longevity to the quality of it. Mm -hmm. So that's very much how I think about it. Yeah. And it's also kind of like the, when I was at Christie's, we talked about stewardship, stewarding a great work of art across time. So you're part yeah. of, uh, of a, a, a chain or a, a relay race. And I like that going back to your technology at Another Tomorrow, you've got the technological insurance that the baton will be pa the past responsible, yes. right? From yes. one caretaker or steward to the next. That's so really, I think, um, putting a contemporary sort of infrastructure behind that, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to uh, just ask our, our guest, Vanessa uh, Barboni Halik, one last question before we, we sign off. Vanessa founded and is CEO of Another Tomorrow, a, uh, a luxury, sustainable fashion brand. And Vanessa, the question I have is it's still women only, right? But do you foresee a day where it might be for guys too? Or Yeah, I do. I do. Um, I think that there's a lot of potential. Um, I did one 
uh, particular interview earlier this year uh, for Bloomberg and the floodgates kind of opened in terms of re requests from from men, which was a good sign that uh, that there's interest. Um, so no, I, I certainly I certainly do, um, which I think is going to be exciting. Yeah, well, uh, we wish you great success. I'll be buying whatever you offer when you do. I have to say, when you're speaking earlier about um, uh, luxury brands and um, competitive set, I was thinking of Allbirds, not because they're necessarily a luxury brand, but they are sustainable. Also, um, I think really a cool brand. I, I, I like mine. And um, I wonder if you have a point of view about that a sort of level of sustainable fashion or yeah, no, I definitely do. And I think that they've been, uh, they've been a real leader in driving awareness, which I think is exciting. And I love what they're doing in articulating the carbon footprint of mm -hmm. each of their items and bringing transparency in that way. I uh, think, you know, one of the points of commonality is, is B Corp. So we're, we're a B Corp and uh, yep. between technology and uh, the B Corp architecture, I think about the two being complementary and really creating an architecture for accountability for all companies. Mm -hmm. And so I would certainly put Allbirds, um, you know, in, in that camp and, uh, and, and many others uh, who, who are willing to do the work. Can you, uh, for our listeners who aren't familiar with B Corps can you, or Benefit Corp, can you say real briefly what it is to you? Yeah, so, you know, B Corps effectively um, ensure a, a, a multi-stakeholder model. So rather than just saying that you're accountable purely to um, shareholders in the bottom line, it means that you're really accountable to, to all of your, your stakeholders. And uh, what that means from a practical perspective is that uh, say what you do and then actually show that you actually do it. It's a fairly arduous <laughs> process uh, and undertaking of opening up your, your books and your suppliers and all that good stuff. Um, but really that's, uh, that's it at its core. And why I think it's so important is that um, there's an actual legal structure around it. So um, to be a better corporation legally um, really helps to align uh, interests, especially with investors. I know that you're even to that point. You're you're you've got a real personal commitment to diversity and inclusion in your organization. And uh, the coming year, aren't you going to uh, do a certain amount of work with black-owned businesses or women yeah. businesses? Exactly. So that was, um, you know, in response to taking a really close look at our own organization, um, particularly in response to the death of George Floyd, you know, we recognize that um, although we have taken, you know, great care in our supply chains at all of our impacts, uh, we were not uh, nearly as diverse uh, or as supportive um, of our own local community as we believe that we need to be. And so uh, we effectively signed on to the 15% pledge, um, which is what uh, Aurora James had uh, really come up with predominantly for multi-brand retailers. But we said, how can we apply this to our own business? And uh, we have the goal of getting to 15% of our operating budget um, and supporting uh, black owned businesses. And being really frank, it's, it's gonna take us a little while. You know, our entire supply chain, um, a lot of it is, uh, is in Europe, it's far flung, um, but we've identified places where we can immediately make change, uh, particularly on, in our creative budgets um, and some of our hiring practices. Mm -hmm. And uh, you gotta do the work. So we're doing yep. the work. You are doing it. I know it's gonna. You're gonna nail it and go past, well past the fifteen percent. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to say a heartfelt thanks to today's guest, Vanessa Barboni Halek, who is the founder and CEO of Another Tomorrow, the sustainable luxury fashion brand. Uh, Vanessa, please come back, and when you have that men's line, please let me know. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been a true honor and a real pleasure.